Hey, welcome to Cardiology Grand Rounds, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here on this uh, cold, rainy Thursday. Um, I just want to say to everyone that the low of losing Jim Harbaugh does not <laughs> negate my high of the national championship. I'm still on here. Um, so okay. I'm so excited today to be introducing uh, Dr. Mark Huffman. Mark is a professor of medicine and co-director of the Global Health Program at WashU in St. Louis. Um, Mark is um, a native of St. Louis. He went to college at Notre Dame and then medical school at Tulane. And I met Mark, um, this is like really hard for me to say, it's probably <laughs> hard for him to hear. Um, I met Mark in 2003. Uh, 2003 was the year I came back to Michigan as faculty and it was the year he started as an intern. Uh, and we worked together on the cardiology <laughs> service. I um, even uh, got him to do a little research project in cerebral related PH. You know, I had visions of him um, taking an interest in PH. At least he took an interest in cardiology. Um, so he was here for his residency and also was a chief resident here. Uh, and then he went to Northwestern for his cardiology fellowship. And, you know, at that time, Mark was developing an interest in global health, and he really thrived at Northwestern, um, did well there for many, many years, um, multiple NIH-funded awards, and um, really just a very prolific research career, um, and then moved to St. Louis a couple of years ago, where he co-directs the Global Health Program and continues um, <laughs> his research really on global health, focusing on, um, you know, some of the, the low- and middle-income countries. Um, does some interesting stuff regarding hypertension, um, really interested in food as medicine, try having dinner at your very favorite restaurants and the guy who does food as medicine and cooking from the table. Um, from you, thank you. I enjoyed it anyway. Um, at any rate, um, Mark is here uh, to talk about catching the global cardiovascular disease runaway. Trey, Mark, so glad to have you back at Michigan. Thanks for coming to us. Thank you, Val. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back. Okay. So these are my disclosures. The last one's the most relevant. Um, I have a position at the George Institute for Global Health, which essentially has received investments to commercialize combination therapy products. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, these are three and three and one pills. I'll talk a little bit about that. So just be aware of that. Um, before I begin, I do would like to acknowledge uh, Craig Alguire, who passed away about um, in 2019. Craig was a chief resident with myself on the left, Scott Bizzavati and Shelley Torlong on the right. Um, he was a cardiologist trained here, uh, worked in Southwest Michigan where he grew up. And, you know, I just really miss Craig. Coming back makes me think about him and his family. You can see we had a lot of fun when we were chief residents based on this picture. But this, this lecture I'd like to say in memory of Craig. Okay, so the learning objectives for today is first, I would very much like you to understand and recognize the role that population growth and aging are having on the global cardiovascular disease trends, both relative, but really the absolute, that's going to be the key. Second, to as identify cost-effective strategies across the spectrum of cardiovascular disease prevention. And then third, appreciate the need of new ideas and approaches, including here in Ann Arbor, in St. Louis, but all around the world. And can these ideas from low and middle income low and middle income countries help us improve cardiovascular health and healthcare and catch the global cardiovascular disease runaway train, because that's what it feels like when I look at the data. So uh, I'm gonna start with Case. This is a patient from a few years ago, uh, came in with chest pain. I was asked to see him on the consult service. He's a Hindi speaking South Asian male in his sixties. He presented with accelerating angina while visiting Chicago from Delhi. He has a history of asthma for which he takes bronchodilators and had increasing dyspnea on exertion in angina over the past month. EMS was called and his symptoms improved with sublingual nitroglycerin. He had a CTA that was negative for PE or acute aerotopathy, but he was noted to have three vessel coronary calcification. He was a febrile hypertensive on exam, almost tachycardic, uh, normal saturation on room air. He was tearful when I came in to see him. His nicknames were flat. He had a two out of six aortic stenosis murmur. Uh, he had no S3, but he had clear lungs. His troponins were mildly elevated. He had a normal creatinine uh, LDL of 96 and A1C of 5.9. He 
Here's his uh, presenting electrocardiogram, uh, sinus rhythm, no acute ST elevations, but he does have some infralateral ST depressions. So what was he crying about was that he didn't want to get a calf. And he was afraid that this was going to be too expensive. And so I came to him at his bedside and started speaking with the translator to talk about, you know, what was I concerned about? And he wanted, I think, to be heard about his fears that he was facing as a visitor in our country. And we think many times in global cardiovascular health, one of the ways in which all of us will be interacting with people from around the world is that we think about people who have immigrated into our country or visiting our country, that's a very common way. And we have a very complicated health system that's scary and expensive. It's a common cause uh, for patients to, to go into bankruptcy. So he had valid fears, but I said to him, listen, I, I, I don't know the extent of which this problem that you have, it looks like it could be potentially serious. And you're in a situation where we need to know this information so that you can go home to your family. And so that was enough, I think, to acquiesce his you know, immediate fears. And he underwent a left heart catheterization. And here on, you can start to see in his proximal LAD with a lesion that'll show a little more clearly, but he's got some left right collaterals that show. Here's the spider view. So you can see that LAD lesion, pretty nasty, a little hazy. He's got a little uh, mild to moderate disease in a circumflex artery. Okay. And then here is his post PCI. Still the wires are in. Dr. Canty would know that Dr. Benzuli would not like this. He would want the wires to be taken out, but this, these are the images that I have. So please bear with me, Dr. Canty. Okay. So he, uh, proximal hazy, 80 to 90% stenosis. His right was a CTO with left to right collaterals, as you saw, and he had a single drug eluting coronary stent placed to his proximal LAD. Uh, he was discharged on GDMT with DAPT and high intensity statin beta blocker and RAS blocker. And I referred him to a cardiologist who I know in Delhi at the All India Institute for Medical Sciences for secondary prevention. So kind of a happy moment of, okay, we can help set you up to prevent the next coronary event. And as we think about, you know, places like, you know, the, this is in Chicago or here in Ann Arbor, we've got patients come in and all the time thinking about, you know, how do I prevent my heart disease? How do I get treated for my heart disease? Um, and heart disease is the leading cause of death around the world. One out of three deaths around the world is due to heart disease. So that's about 19 million deaths. And when we think about big, hairy things that the world tries to do together, the United Nations is the forum by which we do a lot of those things. And there's obviously challenges to that forum right now with rising nationalism, where do we want intergovernmental organizations in individual countries, you know, operations? The UN Sustainable Development Goal number three is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all ages. And this concept of chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases, is something that's increasingly caught the attention of ministers of not only health, but of finance and prime ministers, because the burden that it causes both from a health perspective and a financial perspective. So this target 3.4 is by 2030 to reduce by one third premature mortality defined as less than 70 years from NCEs through prevention and treatment and promote mental health and well-being. And one of the key strategies is the additional target 3.8 of universal health coverage. And you think in our country, we really struggle with universal health coverage. And that's been something that's been debated and we've made fits and starts improvements over the past few decades, but we're still, you know, you know not, not really all the way there. Because we think about that on, not only includes do you have some accessibility, but financial risk protection, which we do a pretty poor job in our country, but it's also poor in many other parts of the world. Access to Quality, and quality is key, essential healthcare services and access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and vaccines for all. So I'll talk about some of these concepts later in the presentation. But this organizing framework just allows us to think about, you know, what are the big things that we're trying to do as a world? And it's not just around health. There's things around poverty, hunger, climate action, and so on. So just late last year, uh, George Mensa and colleagues through the NHLBI, IHME, JAC partnership published the updated CBD mortality data from 
uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And this map just simply shows one, the geographic or spatial differences uh, across countries, but the color coding, the shading shows you there's almost, you know, a tenfold variation in cardiovascular disease mortality around the world. So this, there are places that bear a disproportionate burden compared with other countries. Um, largely in Central Asia is where a lot of the disease is most rampant, but on an absolute scale, countries in Asia, such as China and India, really bear very large absolute burdens of cardiovascular disease mortality. So this is a paper uh, that we published a few years ago, looking at the number of CVD deaths from 1990 to 2019. And what I want you to just contrast these two figures, the one on the left just showing time on the x-axis, number of deaths on an absolute scale by sex on the y-axis, just ever going up, you know, this runaway train, like it's not stopping. And yet on the right-hand figure, we've got the age standardized deaths rate per 100,000 is falling. And that's falling at about 1% per year, which is not bad. So despite this, we're just ever more having more patients and the health systems that are around these patients, they're not growing at that same clip. We can't train enough physicians at that same rate to be able to do this. So we get into trouble where we have long wait times, we have less time with our patients and it's harder to deliver quality services. To put it in some numbers, so over that time period, there's 6.5 million more deaths every single year due to cardiovascular disease. If you look at the number of countries with fewer deaths, like if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, there's about 33 countries out of 204 in this data set that have fewer deaths. And those are largely in Europe. Um, there are 92 countries with lower unadjusted CVD death rate, but when you do age adjustment, you know, 85% of the countries are having a lower age adjusted CVD death rate. So this should be like a win, right? Because you're like, this is great. Like things are working. But that number of people suffering and dying is increasing. So how will we respond? So that tension of absolute and relative, I want you to have in your mind when thinking about what are the arrangements to be able to, what are the policies to be able to prevent and control cardiovascular diseases. So this came from a great paper by Chris Murray a few years ago that summarized some of the key points from this um, 2022 GBD report. And it was really just looking at like, what's going in the right direction, what's going in the wrong direction. So things like body mass index, blood pressure, glucose, for our purposes, those are some of the big ones related to cardiovascular health. Tobacco has been a general success when you think in the, in the mid 1960s, more than 40% of adults used tobacco. Now it's 11%. Now, obviously, electronic cigarettes and vaping has cut into that to some extent, but not, it's nowhere near where it used to be. And that is a success. So we need to, you know, that's got to be good. But dietary stuff is mixed because undernutrition is getting better, but overnutrition, as, as evidenced by high, high body mass index, is getting worse. So food systems need to change with the times as well. Uh, this is another figure from that report that shows that health systems are not ready for this. So on the x-axis is uh, a marker of social development index. And on the y-axis is the average universal health coverage effective coverage index. So higher just simply means better. And as countries that are plotted on the x-axis, uh, the red shows communicable maternal uh, neonatal nutritional diseases. And on the blue dots, these are all for non-communicable diseases. So essentially for almost across all socio-demographic indices, countries' average universal health coverage effective coverage index is lower, unless except at the very highest. And so this means that if you are in a health facility in a low or middle income country, you may have access to anti-malarials or you might have for maternal child health, but you will not have access to hypertensive services. And that's a big problem given the burden of disease that exists. So health systems need to respond to this rising burden, and it's a dual burden. It's not like an either or. I mean, we, you're still going to need to have good maternal health. That's going to be important. And the World Health Organization has outlined strategies that they call best buys that are, have been uh, ones that are highly cost effective, so meaning that they cost less than 100 international dollars per disability adjusted life years saved. And the only health system response one is multi-drug treatment for hypertension, diabetes, and CVD via risk-based approaches. The others are more policy. So these are things like diet and salt, reformulation, institutional policies, mass media campaigns, and front-of-pack labeling, 
You can think about implementation of the framework con convention on tobacco control. So thinking about front of pack labeling, taxes, and so on. So when organizing like an approach toward what would be strategies to implement, it makes sense to go after the ones that are the most highly cost effective, right? Those are gonna be the ones that are you're gonna get the most bang for a buck, not rocket science. So I'm gonna next transition into some of the research that my team and I have been doing using implementation science methods. And this is a, a slide by Jeff Curran, who tries to make implementation science like too simple. So he says, when defining implementation science in very non-scientific language can be helpful. So the intervention, the practice, or the innovation is the thing. And so that could be the drug, the procedure, whatever. So that's the thing. And effectiveness research looks at whether the thing works, like what's the hazard ratio? What's the safety profile of that thing? Implementation research looks at how best to help people and places do the thing. Like, how well are we doing the thing? We know all this stuff works, but how well do we actually do that? And the strategies are the stuff we do to try and help people and places do the thing. And the main implementation outcomes are how much and how well they do the thing. So dissemination implementation has this, I guess, linguistic barrier for many people to feel like, well, I don't really do that. Like, it's not that complicated, actually. I mean, there's a little lingo involved, but generally you're just trying to figure out how to do things that we know work, that are safe and effective. Like, how do we get those scaled up more equitably and more broadly? And there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can do that. So I think to have global action across the spectrum of heart disease prevention, we need to have this comprehensive and cohesive approach. We need to think about tertiary prevention, people who are having acute cardiovascular disease events, just like our patient coming in with his non-stemming. And I would contend that we need global hospital-based quality improvement programs using real-time data and training. And the goal is to have equitable access to optimal care throughout the chain of survival, recognizing that many people don't even make it to the hospital in the first place. And this would have the largest gains in the shortest amount of time. The next would be for secondary and high-risk primary prevention. These are people who have survived a CVD event or are those people at high short-term risk for having a CVD event. And I do think we need deep learning and other mechanisms for discovery. Like think about new models that are based upon drugs like Inclusive. I mean, that's totally different than a pill a day approach, like getting an injection every six months. Well, that's probably gonna be pretty useful. We want more of those sorts of things that are gonna change the game. Um, we do need global research platforms for large, simple trials. It's become very expensive to do clinical trials. And this is a problem for us to move the field forward to really understand efficacy and safety of our new interventions. I argue that we need to simplify treatment, make it easier for our patients to care for themselves. And that can be a range of things like mobile technology, polypills, telehealth, which is now you know, here to stay and team-based care. Other people are gonna be part of this team, not just cardiologists. And the goal is to match the most effective and scalable interventions to patients' needs. And this will have the largest population benefit uh, because it's the largest population at risk over the next decade. Lastly is prim primordial prevention. So these are people who aren't even thinking about cardiovascular disease and don't have any abnormal risk factors in the first place. And this would be doing things like monitoring and improving the global food supply, achieving tobacco endgame, and improving maternal cardiovascular health. So the goals here would be to improve the food supply, denormalize tobacco so the less than 5% of the population uses it, and promote cardiovascular health as early as possible. And this would have the overall largest effect over the longest period. So I'll start with the first one and describe some uh, research activities in, in this bucket. So I helped lead the acute coronary syndrome quality improvement uh, in Kerala clinical trial. This is across 63 hospitals and more than 21,000 patients. We used a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial design that was in Kerala, India, and in South India, where we randomized hospitals in a one-way crossover fashion to receive a toolkit that helped them achieve better quality of care. So this was things like uh, protocolized care, audit and feedback care, training and supervision. Um, adjusting for cl cluster in time, we did not demonstrate a reduction in 30-day major adverse cardiovascular events, nor death. The absolute numbers, though, look at this. The 30-day MACE rate in the control period was 6.4, but it was 5.3 in the intervention. So if you have a heart attack in Kerala, your outcomes are pretty similar to what they are here in the United States. That's great. Like, way to go, Kerala cardiologists. And this was in, with support from the Cardiological Society of India Kerala chapter. We did demonstrate increases in reperfusion, GDMT during the hospital stay and discharge GDMT. So I was very you know, appreciative and fortunate to be part of this culture change that's been occurring in South India to improve the quality and safety of acute coronary syndrome care. 
And one of your faculty, Dr. Melamothu, has been part of this as well with Thomas Alexander, who is uh, to led the Tamil Nadu STEMI program. And this figure really shows just the schematic of a uh, hub and spoke approach towards getting uh, patients have a, having a higher likelihood of reperfusion therapy. Um, I saw Thomas a few months ago, and the goal is to try and have this hub and spoke model throughout not just India, but beyond. And so he's got an organization that he works very diligently to be able to promote reperfusion of patients with STEMI. This is very important. Patients are going to be having STEMIs all the time. And we need systems that will be able to recognize that and treat them quickly because that's a highly cost-effective strategy. And so someone who, like me, who focuses clinically on prevention, I do not want there to be poor STEMI care for my patients. My cath lab colleagues will say, oh, Huffman, one of my patients come in and they say, oh, no, failed prevention. Good thing we're here. And I said, I am so glad that you're here. So we need a comprehensive approach here. So next, moving on to secondary and primary prevention. So David Flood, who's one of your faculty here at Michigan, is an outstanding investigator who has worked with this organization known as HPAC, which is a group of demographic health surveys, um, or STEP surveys as they're known, from 2013 to 2019. This includes data from more than 40 low and middle income countries and more than 116,000 individuals. And through this and a report that one of my mentees, a medical student at Washu Jingjing Zhu, led, identified these extraordinarily low rates of secondary and primary prevention use. So if we look at the types uh, in the first part of the table of statin, aspirin, and blood pressure medications, we see generally for statin and aspirin higher rates than primary prevention, but I mean, boy, that's really low, right? Um, less than one third across the board. And then if we start to think about you know, the number, we want people to get on three overall drug classes. It's less than 10%, even for people who've already had a heart attack and stroke. So the most common experience is that somebody takes no medicines after they've had a heart attack and stroke. That's, that's not good. And this isn't facility-based care, like people coming in to see you or me in clinic. These are people in communities who are being surveyed. So that access piece is gonna be really important for our patients, not just for clinical services, but for medicines. So there's a massive gap, and this has not improved. These data have been shown previously in data from the Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiology, or PURE study by Salim Youssef back in 2011, and there are emerging data coming from out of Salim's group that says that it hasn't gotten any better nearly 15 years later. So ew, we got to work on that. So combination therapy, including polypills, and include these three classes of medicines, have been demonstrated to be highly effective. This is part of the polypill trialist collaboration, which I'm a part. This was a paper Phil Joseph led that shows some of the changes in, across uh, LDL cholesterol on the top left panel for fixed dose combination shown in red and compared with control in blue. On the bottom left panel is changes in systolic blood pressure. And the main outcome is shown on the right hand panel, shows time on the x-axis so over five years and the cumulative incidence on the y-axis. So individuals randomized to polypills had a 38% lower hazard of experience in a major cardiovascular event compared with control. So polypills are the type of delivery strategy that I think about as an implementation strategy. The drugs are the same. And so you said, well, I want this drug or that drug, fine. You know, there's no, this is the concept that we're trying to promote of like, how do we move this idea forward of increasing adoption and implementation of these drugs? So, I mean, that's a pretty powerful effect in our opinion. There are, as you might imagine, higher rates of things like dizziness and a little bit higher rate of GI bleeding. As individuals are exposed to these medicines more, it's expected that side effects would be more common, right? Compared to not taking any of these drugs. So based on these data, we submitted uh, our fourth attempt and it worked finally this past summer, uh, an application to the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines to add polypills to the essential medicines list. And there's a report from CNN, the World Heart Federation, we at WashU put out a press release related to this. And this work was led by Anuba Agarwal. And we have a forthcoming paper in Nature Medicine summarizing the data that we had submitted. We've used this mechanism for other drugs ranging from clopidogrel to DOAX to spironolactone to two drug blood pressure lowering combination therapy. And what this allows is when you have this designation that it can be in a pre-qualification program. So countries can buy this at bulk at lower risk to the pharmaceutical company, 
but also lower cost to countries. So the Pan American Health Organization, for example, has used our previous application that was accepted on two drug combination therapy for blood pressure lowering for their pooled procurement fund. So that allows for cheaper drugs to be available all throughout Latin America because of this policy change. So these are the sorts of things like people that sometimes are based in the US can be doing to contribute to global health policy. The national level lists are also incredibly important for national level uh, uh, insurance coverage. So those, you know, just because it's at the WHO doesn't mean that the job is done by any means. But this has been an important aspect of the work we've tried to do to improve accessibility of cardiovascular essential medicines. Um, we, have a, we have a paper under review that David Watkins has been leading looking at polypel modeling across four different scenarios shown in the table on, on the left. The first one is step-up therapy among individuals who are already treated, but they're under-treated. So someone on one or more medicines. And from 2030 to 2050, that's projected to prevent or avert 11 to 14 million cardiovascular disease deaths. That's, that's a lot of people who are already being treated who are likely to be uh, have their CBD deaths averted. Scenario two is tight initiation of among individuals with CBD and are aware of their diagnosis, but are not treated. So you think about all of those secondary prevention people. Uh, that's 38 to 46 million. Now, you, if you start to get into a, a wider range of including high-risk primary, 50 to 60 million, and scenario four is just a faster scale-up, thinking about a rate set would be akin to the scale-up of antiretroviral therapy for the management of people living with HIV. So really fast, very large scale. And that'd be close to 100 million uh, CBD deaths averted. The figure on the right just shows these different scenarios and where the, uh, uh, the gains would be realized with many of the gains shown in the purple and green. These are in low and middle income countries with less gains in high income countries. Now, if you contrast this with uh, the mortality comparisons with implementation of the WHO's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, that's 20 million. That's just CBD deaths. There's obviously other forms of death that are due to tobacco. But to give you a sense of the scale here, if you had 80% hypertension coverage, which would be remarkable, that's 53 million. So getting the guideline-directed drugs for patients with atherosclerosis could have a remarkably large effect on trying to manage those individuals who either have or are at risk for cardiovascular disease deaths. So my message here is we have to figure out strategies to get patients these medicines because it, it has the potential to help them live longer. Now, if we think about hypertension by itself, this is a figure from the NCD risk collaborators that tries to, it's called an alluvial plot. I'm from Missouri, so we've got a lot of rivers. We like alluvial things. And the one on the left shows all women with hypertension. And then the little alluvial plots show across different regions, such as high income Western, Central and Eastern Europe, and so on and so forth. The the first left-hand panel uh, shows those who are not diagnosed. So 41% of women with hypertension around the world do not have their hypertension diagnosed. So that's kind of the biggest problem is getting diagnosis. As you can see, it's the widest. Of those who are diagnosed but not treated, that's 12%. And then of those who are treated, 24% are treated but not controlled. So at the end of the day, you got 23% control rate. That's pretty lousy. The system is not working for most people. So the and the data for men are just even worse. We can see a little bit of regional variability at the bottom line. Um, places like uh, Oceania and Sub-Saharan Africa are, are at 12 and 13% control rates, but really all around the world, it's not going very well. So how do you improve hypertension control system efficiency to treat as many as, there's about 1.4 billion people around the world who have hypertension. This is gigantic, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. And if you think most people need like two to three drugs to get their blood pressure under control, that's about 500 billion tablets for one year, for one, for one drug per year, or one, one trillion tablets for two drugs, and 1.5 trillion tablets. So they got to all be flying around the world and getting in people's mouths. Like, oh my God, like that's a supply chain nightmare. So we need more and simpler blood pressure cuffs, more health workers, major investments in information systems, and bigger, stronger, faster supply chains. And these new therapies, these long-acting blood pressure lowering medicines, like, I don't know if that's going to be the future. It's like, I have some enthusiasm for that because of the simplicity. I have some anxiety about my patient who will remain supine for two months because of, you know, how effective these drugs may be. 
But the idea of combination therapy, it's one of many interventions, but it's usually considered on the patient level. But I don't know any other intervention that reduces the number of pills by half or more. So things to simplify the supply chain. And so there have been, you know, studies looking at two drugs and three drugs, and Clara Chow and Anthony Rogers kind of asked the, the math question, is four-fourths greater than one with the quartet trial? And so this was a, a randomized controlled trial comparing quarter-dose quad pill. So this is Herbisartan 37.5, Amlo 1.25, and Dapamide 0.625, and Basoprolol 2.5, compared with Herbisartan 150 among patients with mild to moderate hypertension. And so the figure shown here shows uh, uh, time again on the x-axis. The primary outcome was at 12 weeks, and the y-axis is the automated systolic blood pressure. So individuals randomized to the quad pill had a 6.9 millimeter greater systolic blood pressure lowering difference and a 5.8 millimeter greater uh, diastolic blood pressure lowering difference at 12 weeks. And this was sustained uh, for 12 months in a subgroup of participants. So really the benefits for most of our drugs start at the lower end of the dosing. And we get a log linear relationship with side effects as we increase dosing. So that's generally why four fourths is greater than one. We did a parallel trial called Quartet USA in federally qualified health centers in Chicago, where we had a, a similar quad pill. We have different manufacturing procedures, so that's why we use Candesartan instead of Herbisartan. And we had a smaller sample size at 62 patients. I'd like to thank Ken Jamerson, who was a member of the DSMB and was really helpful uh, for our study moving forward. Uh, as we navigated the pandemic, it was a big, we had to make a lot of adjustments on the fly. So thank you, Ken. The panel on the left shows changes in systolic blood pressure for individuals in the control and intervention arms in gray and purple, respectively. And then diastolic blood pressure is shown on the right. So we observed a 4.8 millimeter lower systolic blood pressure in the intervention group and a 4.9 millimeter mercury diastolic difference uh, in the intervention group. The systolic was not statistically significant. It's the direction and magnitude of effect are similar to what was observed in quartet, and we're doing some pooled analyses with, with Clara. So now that we, we're thinking about what the products are, I want to think about what's the strategy package to be able to deliver this at large scale. So the World Health Organization Hearts Technical Package is kind of the go-to bundle that most countries are using. And it's been, it's been rolled out in more than 20 countries, more than 1,300 primary care facilities in Latin America, led by uh, the Pan American Health Organization. So David Flood's work is in this, uh, is part of this as well in, in PAHO. And we've been working with, um, I've been working with DK OG at the University of Abuja for the past seven years or so. And we've been first adapting the WHO Hearts Package um, and then we've been implementing this and evaluating its implementation and effectiveness on hypertension treatment and control rates in 60 primary care centers in the federal capital territory of Nigeria from January 2020, great timing, uh, to December 2023. And this multi-level package really includes things like a standardized treatment protocol that DK was part of with Resolve to Save Lives. We created a patient registration and impanelment program, so that's a health system level intervention prioritization of fixed dose combination therapy, health system level again. So this is now on the national essential medicines list. Uh, Team-based care, including training and quarterly site supervision. So we go to 60 PhDs four times a year for you know, about four years. And home blood pressure monitoring, health coaching in a small sample, which there was less actually acceptability of that than we had anticipated. So that's something moving forward. We you know, will be offered to a smaller extent we did include uh, additional strategies. Hearts does not have a financial strategy, which is really important if we think about what you know, systems and patients will need. So we actually primed a drug revolving fund so that there was essentially reduced cost medications at, at wholesale cost. That's run by pharmacists in, in the state. And then we did public health messaging. So we had more than 300 community meetings with more than 6,500 6, participants coming to those to make people aware that hypertensive services were now available in primary care. So these are our results that DK presented uh, at the Heart Association meeting uh, in the fall. So between January 2020 and October 2023, more than 21,000 participants were registered. There was more than 133,000 unique visits. I have the 
participant characteristics in the pre-implementation and implementation period shown in the table, they're a little older in the implementation period, a little higher proportion of females. Body mass index was high and uh, stable between the, the two groups. And almost half either had no formal or primary. And it was about 25 in each group. So, I mean, these are people who are seeking primary care, do not have private insurance or physicians or things like that. And over time, the blood pressures did increase of those who were showing up for their first visit, meaning that we were able to capture people with higher blood pressures in the community. So 157 over 97, these are people who should be treated for their high blood pressure. The figure on the bottom just shows on a log scale, uh, the recruitment over time, we were able to recruit during COVID because these were, place, these were places where people were, were seeking care. And you can see the really, as I said, modest number of participants who wanted to participate in home blood pressure monitoring. So these are our results. Um, our co-primary outcomes were change in slope and treatment and control rates. And so the table on the top shows basically the figure in numerical uh, format. So baseline, the treatment rate was actually very high, 76%. And it increased in the implementation period, got to 91% at the start and kept going to 97% by the latest data. We're cleaning the last quarter. So during the pre-implementation period, that was increasing at 1% uh, versus 0.1%. So, you know, once you, you kind of have a ceiling effect that's observed there. Control rate started out at 23%, again, higher than that community average, because this is a facility-based study. And it was 37% by January of 2021. And it reached as high as 56% in October of 2023. So the, the change in slope, again, was higher in the pre-implementation period. We probably had too long of a pre-implementation period, but also we had a really long implementation period. So we achieved 50% um, in late 2021, shown down here, and we kept the control rates above 50% for more than two years. So this wasn't a flash in the pan thing. This was a system that was operating in a way that we were definitely excited about. And you can look at the, the green color on the bottom figure shows the control rate for home blood pressure monitoring participants prior to enrollment. We were trying to find those people who were not being controlled through the usual pathways. And so I think we did a reasonable job with that, but again, that's a small number. So this shows the mean systolic and mean diastolic blood pressure at enrollment among baseline, um, and then January, 2021 and October, 2023 again. Essentially that we had pretty stable mean blood pressures of people who came in at enrollment with a little bit higher, truthfully, during the implementation period. But if we look at it during their follow-up visits uh, shown in the dashed lines, we can see that participating in a hypertension treatment program lowered the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. That may not be <laughs> rocket science, but it allows us to make sure we're you know, triangulating these data from these 60 PhDs and more than 21,000 patients. So on average, by the end, the blood pressures were 134 over 83, getting pretty close to contemporary control rates. The national uh, guidelines in Nigeria recommend 140 over 90 uh, still in Nigeria. And what about those strategies that we talked about? So change in mean fixed dose combination therapy. So the figure shows that very clearly the step up effect uh, where we went from 43% during baseline and then above 80%, 83% in January, 2021, as high as 90% in October, 2023. And so the step effect shows like, yep, when we tried to get fixed dose combination therapy implemented into the protocol and available at the uh, PHCs, they were delivered, they were used. So that demonstrates that strategy was successfully implemented. This also looks at the proportion of PHCs with at least one 30-day dose of a protocol blood pressure lowering medication. So at the beginning of this, the PHCs did not have drugs on site. People would have to go elsewhere. And so over that system strengthening, working with pharmacists shows a very clear increase so that by the end of the study, this was normal part of the pharmacy practices at these PHCs. So these, the supply chain aspect of this was critical because without the medicines, the health coaching will help and health behaviors will help, but we're going to need medicines to help these people with their high blood pressure for sure. We've also looked at these domains of normalization and sustainability. So normalization using the NOMAD scale looks at things like coherence, cognitive participation, collective action, and reflexive monitoring. Essentially, is this part of routine care? And so we, we 
had responses from 214 frontline healthcare workers of asking them, like, is this going to be part of what you do? What do you think about this? Is this part of your routine practice? And the medians were four and above, which suggests very good normalization. Um, for sustainability, that's we sustained that high blood pressure control rate, but the ability to do that is assessed through this instrument called the Program Sustainability Assessment Tool, or PSET. And then you can see the different domains that you would expect to influence whether or not something you know, has the ability to be sustained. Like, does the environment support it? Is there funding stability? Who are the partnerships? And so on. And so again, we found that there was high sustainability. These were among program administrators, clinic administrators. So that's why the sample size is a little bit lower. So we're really excited to be moving to the next phase of this work um, with our next, next sort of phase is going to be working across the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria, and then also integrating diabetes services into primary care. Our hope is ultimately that at every PHC throughout Nigeria, we'll have hypertensive services available, meaning there'll be trained staff with support, with functioning blood pressure cuffs. There's an information system to capture people coming in and following them up over time. Um, and then there's medicines that will not only be available, but affordable and thus accessible for patients. So we're excited about this work and have found that we have, we have ideas and frameworks and, and tools to be able to share with people like David, Flood, like who's doing work in Guatemala, uh, Victor Dablo, who's doing work in Peru and, and other groups around the world. So these are a few just pictures of our study team in action. This DK and Andrew Moran working on the National Hypertension Protocol. Um, Regina Suku collecting dry blood spot sample. We looked at COVID uh, antibodies among frontline healthcare workers at a, as a serum survey sub-study. And then uh, Grace Eugenia Tunde doing some qualitative research training. So it's been a, you know, a lot of fun and we feel like, you know, kind of just getting started. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about primordial prevention and I'll focus a little bit on this monitoring and improving the global food supply. So going back to those best buys, I, I had alluded to these interventions related to dietary sodium. And those include reducing salt intake through reformulation of food products, which is easy for us to say, it's hard for companies to do that. They don't wanna do that because they worry about, is that gonna disrupt, you know, does the customer like that product anymore? Or do we have to create a new product? So that's a trickier thing to do. Uh, second is reduce salt intake through the establishment of supportive environments and public institutions. My hospital in St. Louis is not a healthy place. I wish it were. Like the food environment is unhealthy. There's like a murderer's row of vending machines that, and we have to do better, like as health systems to lead on this so that when people come to our hospitals, our clinics, they expect that things will be healthy, but also, you know, delicious. And figuring out like how to do that from a cost perspective is not easy. We need restaurant tours, we need food service providers, but we cannot accept the status quo where there's junk food just kind of everywhere. Um, reduce salt intake through behavior change, communication, mass media campaign. It's a little more priming, more will help with knowledge. And then reduce salt intake through implementation of front packed labeling. Really depends upon what's that, what does that label look like? Is it sort of numbers? Is it interpretive? Or is it like in Latin America, warning labels? And those work and food companies are not excited about this. And when there was pushback by uh, food companies when Chile started this, uh, and they said, well, we could never sort of create these labels for all these different products that we have all over the world. The Chilean government was like, no problem, we got this, we'll get stickers. We'll just slap the stickers on. And then that's what they did. And now it's incorporated when you, you know, when you travel to Latin America, you'll see high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat. So uh, with funding from NHLBI, we've been conducting the Nigeria Sodium Study where we do retail service, for example. And we use a program known as Food Switch that's developed by the George Institute to collect data on foods. And so we've collected you know, so more than 7,000 products that are available in the Nigerian retail environment. Um, there's Adadaya Oja in the middle with a, a officials from the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control. It's like the FDA equivalent. And then uh, some data collectors in a store in Abuja City in the federal capital territory. And from some of this work, we've demonstrated that 14% of products have no labeling at all for sodium or salt, and only 1.5% of labels have met the 2019 draft guidance by NAVDEC. So we're trying to say to NAVDEC, you probably need to modify what the guidance is if almost none of the companies make it. Yes, they can do better, but it's just gonna be a contentious relation. You gotta work with the food industry on some level. And the easy place is to start with those products that don't have any label, like they need to have a label. 
Um, and then we've done some additional work on trans fats. Um, it's another area of investigation where 5% of products have artificial trans fats, which we've eliminated those in the United States and nobody really cares or notices, but it's led to a reduction in cardiovascular disease deaths. And we've modeled that it can prevent about 10,000 heart attacks annually in Nigeria and save about $90 million. We've also been conducting uh, population surveys. So uh, on the top left is Tony Oji and uh, Clementina Okoli, who are with a village leader to get permission to be able to work in that village to collect data on the dietary sources of sodium. So these best buys sound like a good idea, but actually there's not really granular data on where do Nigerians get most of their dietary sodium from. So that's a method that's been used here in the United States by led by the University of Minnesota where the estimate is typically about 70% of Americans' dietary sodium comes from processed or packaged foods. So we got our study team on the, you know, the vests and sitting you know, out, out uh, with community members working on some of the questions. And you can see how detailed the, the dietitians work. This is Clementina's team of measuring, weighing. I mean, it's really nitty gritty of getting into these details. I'm learning a lot about the methods behind this so that we can have reliable estimates on where sodium comes from. Our preliminary estimates, about half comes from home cooked food, about a quarter comes from packaged or processed foods, and a quarter comes from street food where people would go out for lunch or something like that. And that's an area that just has not been regulated at all. Um, Bruce Neal, a friend and colleague at the George Institute, led the salt substitute and stroke study that brings to mind an alternative approach than what's been promulgated by the WHO of salt substitutes. So these are potassium rich salts. So it's just one white granular powder for another, but this other one has 25% potassium chloride. So this was a large randomized trial of 600 villages in rural China, about 21,000 participants, who had a mean age of 65 years, about half were female. And more than two thirds had a prior stroke and the others were a high risk for an initial stroke. Uh, the cumulative incident curves are shown on the left with time on the x-axis and the incident on the right. And you can see a lower hazard of, of individuals or clusters who were randomized to the salt substitute compared with regular salt over a five-year period. And this led to a between-group systolic blood pressure difference of 3.3 millimeters of mercury, and that was led to a 14% lower risk of stroke and a 12% lower risk of all-cause death with no difference in hyperkalemia. So Bruce is an ambitious person who is now interested in changing the world's salt supply, just like it, there's been iodine that's been put in to, uh, uh, to help with the, uh, the world's salt supply. He feels like this is a strategy that he's now embarking upon. So salt substitutes may actually be a better strategy for much of Nigeria, given that half of the so dietary sodium comes from home-cooked foods. Um, we've had a lot of fun getting together. On the bottom left, that's uh, the Director General of NAVDAC and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Abuja. And DK would get us all, like, we'd all wear the same clothes and hats and, like, have, you know, kind of these video boards. It's, it's a lot of fun. There's Clementino at, at another event with students. Um, and so we try to be productive and, and enjoy ourselves along the way. So the kind of the elephant in the room is around BMI trends. Like, that was mentioned earlier in those GBD uh, trends of like adverse trends related to body mass index. And I was interested in trying to figure out, well, how many countries is body, mean body mass index declining? And this again from the NCD risk group. And the top shows the highest and like going in the wrong direction. And so that's St. Lucia, Honduras, Egypt, Jamaica, Comoros, Samoa, Kabadi, Uzbekistan, St. Kitts, and Ghana. Uh, and then on the, the lowest tenor are, are the limited number of countries that are getting thinner. And this would be France, Czech Republic, Malta, Japan, Andorra, Lithuania, Singapore, Spain, Nauru, and Bahrain. So it's a real sort of slow, you got to squint to see it because most of the rest of the world is, is getting bigger. And that's this piece of this runaway train of like, okay, well, a growing population, aging population, there's not a lot of treatment happening and the food environment is pretty rough, pretty rough. And we think about how are we gonna help people lose weight? So, I mean, clip one, right? Here we go. It's really effective, about seven kilos of weight loss at three to 36 months based upon this uh, obesity review paper in 2022. Bariatric surgery, obviously a lot more resource intensive, a lot of potential risks. The way in which these outcomes are defined is always a little unusual to me. It's like 
46 to 74 percent excess body weight loss. And so you can see that, you know, how it's calculated be below. Um, intensive behavioral intervention program, uh, 2.3 kilos. And then food is medicine, which Val had, had mentioned, tiny, you know, very small effect. Looks like it's probably real, but it's, you know, it's getting blown out of the water uh, tenfold by, by GLP-1 receptor agonists. So, you know, you say obesity is not an Ozempic deficient state. You, you know, like it, it, it helps, but, you know, we're going to have to think about other strategies besides just GLP-1. And so food is medicine, and Scott Hummel is, is leading a cooperative study through the VA on this, and it ranges from medically tailored meals for those who have serious illness or disability who cannot cook, shop or cook for themselves. So think about early days of HIV, uh, meals on wheels, to medically tailored food for those with acute or chronic illness, um, and then healthy food for those who are malnourished or food insecure. So that would get to things like um, produce prescription programs, vouchers for fruit and veg, those sorts of things. So those are being actively tested to figure out, is this gonna be part of the answer? Thanks. Um, but when I think about the environment in which we're operating in, this is a paper Abby Baldridge led out of our team using food switch based data uh, in collaboration with um, the George Institute, um, showing the food categories on the left hand panel. So if you just look at more than 230,000 products that are in this data set, and HSR stands for Health Star Rating, it's a way that the Australian and New Zealand food community, sort of in the government, rates sort of the healthfulness of the food. And this is in the US, we applied that. And then this level of processing of ultra processing using the NOVA classification. So 71% of packaged foods and drinks in the US are junk food. Like, and then you, you know, you go to a grocery store, it's not rough, you, you see it. So if you're gonna have this like a wash with junk food, like what are you gonna do? You know, it's, you're not gonna ozempic your way out of this. It's just not gonna happen. So we also tried to look at like, well, who's responsible for this? So this, again, alluvial plot, kind of complicated. On the top, it's all the manufacturers and they're ranked by the healthiest on the left, high HSR to the least healthy on the right. And then the various products that they make from you know, categories of like eggs and fruit and fish all the way to candy. Um, so you can see the you know, why is like a candy company basically. But there's, there's such a range of ultra processed products among the top 25, it's anywhere from 26 to 100. So they're all doing some of this, but no single manufacturer has more than 10% of the market share. If you look at like, uh, you know, the sales data that relate to this. So you're not, it's so risky for a company to say like, well, we're gonna do some healthy product. Like we're gonna do a healthy product line. That's not gonna work. They're gonna get steamrolled by the competition. So there needs to be some ways for us to come together to think about how do we have healthier food that's more normative, way less processed food than what is currently available. And it's not going to be for the good, you know, food companies to lead us in this. We have to be part of this in some way. There will be some government regulation th that's going to be necessary. I don't know what that exactly looks like, but this is how it feels, you know, all messy. Okay, so the last is just to talk about the, I've been lucky to work with a lot of trainees uh, over the past, you know, decade plus um, who've been doing some really great work. And these are the new voices. These are the new ideas. And uh, so I'm excited about them. And some of them have been here, like Kyle Yu, uh, who's a resident here at Michigan. Uh, Amisha Patel, she was a medical student here. So great Michigan connection. I was also helped create the World Heart Federation's Emerging Leaders Program, which has trained more than 220 emerging leaders from more than 50 countries in implementation research, health systems, and health policy since 2014, trying to think about trying to move the needle all around the world. And I'll make a little plug for the Pride program at WashU, which is co-led by Victor Davila, Lisa De Los Fuentes, and DC Rao, which is accepting applications now for US-based uh, investigators, including those who are interested in global health who are from diverse backgrounds to participate in a all expenses uh, training program. So um, my take home points, as I hope I've hammered home to you, population growth and aging drive the large and growing CBD burden despite falling age-adjusted CBD death rates in most countries. Trends in diet, BMI, and blood pressure threaten these gains. Highly cost-effective strategies exist across the entire spectrum of CBD prevention, but far greater investment, implementation, scale-up, and political will are needed to achieve global health goals. I encourage those of you who are interested to get involved. There's lots of opportunities here.
And great people and ideas come from everywhere, but we'll, we need a lot more support of both to catch the runaway train of CBD. Will we be ready to support, listen, include, and accept new voices and ideas, including those from low and middle income countries? So I've got a lot of people to thank at WashU, the George, uh, previous institution at Northwestern, University of Abuja, PHFI and CCDC, the Cardiological Society of India, and my sponsors. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Great, thanks. Wonderful, it's a perspective that we don't think about a lot. And I'm so proud that you kind of got in on the ground floor and now you're driving all this. And really uh, I think that's really exciting. Um, are there any questions that anyone else has? Uh, if there's anything in the mind. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for that, that was, that was really, uh... Um, fantastic to hear about the the poly pill the, the the stoppage rate for statin for example are, is like up to 40 percent i think in populations and then aspirin is similar to people stop 20 30 percent of the time the, does the poly pill putting it all together in a in a box does that does that lower the overall stoppage rate and and that does that lead to more effectiveness or does or does the stoppage rate because of the effect on the body lead to an overall higher stoppage rate because it's all in one pill? So if you stop one, you stop them all. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Good good question. So um, this has come up before. There seems to be a somewhat similar persistence curves and therefore starting at a higher rate on that initiation, at least from data from the space collaboration would suggest that you know, you're gonna end up at a higher adherence rate over time kind of across the board. And then the some of the polypill trialists would say, yeah, we're not totally sure, but we just know that it reduces cardiovascular events by more than a third. So we think that this is a good strategy. Obviously for those individuals who are well-treated and can adhere to a regimen that's maybe complex or even, you know, those are the people who are gonna benefit. But that's most people around the world are taking zero medicines. So you're sort of like, okay, so the people who are showing up in clinic are doing really well, like don't touch them. Like keep, it's the people who like struggle to come back, who are hard to follow up and they're just, you know, they need help. They need a different approach. Mark, I'm gonna ask you one question, just trying to bring it a little bit closer to home. Like what you're doing is really exciting and, um, you know, really meaningful worldwide. And, but most of us don't do that, but we still see health disparities in our everyday lives. And this is something that um, institutionally we're very attuned to and, you know, we have a couple of priorities in, in our base priorities to reduce health disparities. There's a, a pediatric metric, which has to do with flu vaccination. And there's an adult metric that has to do with hypertension control. There's a huge gap in the hypertension control in the primary care population attributed to our primary care doctors um, between blood pressure control in whites and Black. So is there any of what you've done that you can translate to what we do every single day in the populations that we serve? Yeah, thanks, pal. So the HEARTS package came out of Kaiser's Northern California experience that Mark Jaffe led. So that's kind of local, global, and then bringing it back. Team-based care is recommended by the CDC, for example, to reduce inequities. It's considered like a best practice for hypertensive services. So this is super relevant to how our health systems operate, to be not relying upon cardiologists to be managing most of the hypertension that, and not even physicians. So we think about how states regulate non-physicians such as pharmacists to be able to prescribe blood pressure lowering medications, for example. The payment models for those are often siloed and not well integrated into our existing workflows and funding models. But to me, that's the answer. I mean, it's, it, is, these are things that can be done by non-physicians very well with high patient satisfaction. Ben Sirica's work um, in Massachusetts has shown that for both blood pressure and cholesterol as well. So I think there's more that's emerging that would allow us to take some of these ideas. We, we like to think about global, local, like what are the things we're doing in St. Louis when, when I was in Chicago and what are the things we're doing internationally? And because the challenges are often more similar than they are different. 
All right, Mark, I want to thank you for returning to Michigan. We miss you, but we're so proud of you. And thanks everyone for attending.